Without further ado, I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. Um, I'm going to read the, Karen, should I read the whole bio? I think I should direct you guys to, I'll be, I'll be time-wise and, and direct you all to our website so you can see the whole bio, but I am going to read part of it. Um, Karen Freeman Wilson began serving as the president and CEO of Chicago Urban League in January 2020. Perfect time to take over a role like that, huh? <laughs> She brings a passion for equity and social justice to the organization, which works to advance economic, educational, and social progress for African Americans through direct service and advocacy. Having served in the public arena most of her professional life, Karen has a deep experience in addressing issues that urban impact that impact urban communities. She was mayor of her hometown of Gary, Indiana, from 2012 to 2019. Did any of you all see her on Undercover Boss? <laughs> It's an amazing episode. I didn't see it until after I got to know Karen, so it was even more funny. She was the first female to lead the city of Gary and the first African-American mayor in the state of Indiana. Her mayoral accomplishments include job creation, completion of $100 million in airport runway relocation, and the development of key areas in the city. She previously served as the Attorney General, Director of the State of, Illinois, of Indiana Civil Rights Commission, and Presiding Judge of the Gary City Court. She also served as Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute and CEO of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, where she's currently Board Vice Chair. Um, there's a whole lot of other things I could say about Karen. Again, I'm going to direct you to the website. Um, I am extremely proud to introduce this Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law graduate to come and speak to the, to the City Club, and it is my hope that her wonderful children um, and her husband, Carmen, are watching from afar. Karen? I thought we had water up here, but we don't. I'll give you water. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, what a treat to join all of you in person. Uh, I think we're still getting used to it. And so you can tell people are sometimes they don't know whether to bump or shake or hug or, or just wave. But the uh, reality is, is that we are uh, returning together to a new normal and, and this is part of it. I want to thank my friend, Jackie Robinson Ivy, for that gracious introduction. At least I thought she was my friend <laughs> until she pointed you to the um, Undercover Boss episode. <laughs> because, you know, until people see that, they think that I'm uh, intellectual and, <laughs> and serious and uh, you know, very stern, and then they see undercover boss and they leave thinking, you know, she's kind of a fool. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it was not about me, it was about bringing a positive light to the city of Gary. Um, I am also, I, I want to thank Dr. Mazur and, and the board uh, for the opportunity to address the City Club. I had the first chance to sit at the City Club when Mayor Daley was still the mayor, um, and uh, we came and, and heard him then. And then I've heard a couple of other of your guests, and so it's an honor to stand where uh, many people much more worthy than I could stand. Um, you know, I appreciated Jackie's introduction because my mother still enjoys hearing good things uh, being said about me, but she also taught me very early, it's not about who I am, but whose I am. And uh, she and my father, a steel worker, also impressed upon me the importance of service, uh, public and otherwise, and humility. Uh, and while I'm the person that you see standing here today, it is my tremendous honor to work with an amazing team. And, uh, and so many of them are here today. 
I want to ask them to stand because uh, while I get to take all the credit, they do all the work. And of course, um, I work for a board. And it is a board of, uh, I counted them, 32 people. And those of you who work for boards know what it is to have 32 or 26 or 12 or 50 bosses. Uh, and two of them are here that I've seen at least. And you've heard uh, Eric Smith introduced uh, and of course, Mr. McKeever. Uh, and Mr. McKeever and I uh, have known each other for a very, very long time because his son and I, son Steve and I, were classmates in law school. So uh, I tell Steve now I have a new favorite McKeever. <laughs> so today I really just want to talk very briefly because I really much rather have uh, and hear from you with questions and, and to be able to answer that. But I want to tell you about the past, the present, and the future of the Chicago Urban League. And then I want to make a case because um, I'm still a lawyer and I don't get to practice, so today I get to practice on you. <laughs> uh, I want to make the case for why our work should be your work. Many of you know that the Urban League originated out of the Settlement House Movement. And of course, the Settlement House Movement originated here in Chicago because Jane Addams was the founder. But with the great migration, um, from many places, but the great migration from the South to large cities in the North, there was a need for an organization that would not only help new residents, in this case, new black residents, get settled, but also to integrate into their new homes. Hence, the National Urban League was born, and shortly after the birth of the National Urban League, the Chicago Urban League was established here in 1916. And so as that organization that helped new residents from Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama and many other communities in the South as they helped those residents get settled with housing, with employment, uh, with social opportunities, with business opportunities, the Urban League became a very important part of the community. And isn't it interesting that still today we are helping citizens of the Chicago land area get settled? Uh, and isn't it interesting that there's still a need for black residents to get settled uh, over 105 years later. That tells you something about our community. It tells you a lot about our country. And as we work in the areas of housing and financial empowerment, of entrepreneurship and innovation, of youth services, of workforce development, of leadership development, and of research and policy. While our focus and the nature of our work has changed, 
the underpinning importance of it to the community, particularly to the black community, is very much the same. And so today, the Urban League is still involved in programming. Programming in housing and financial empowerment. And so we help people very often to get their first homes or we help them to keep the homes they have. But we've also expanded that housing mission to financial empowerment. What does that mean? It means to really think about the accumulation of wealth beyond getting property, beyond housing. It really means to think about now that you have a stimulus check, what do you do with it? Do you pay bills or do you use it as an opportunity to create a nest egg for you and your family? Now that you have the opportunity through the child care tax credit to provide a little bit more income, or now that it's provided a little bit more income, what does that look like really for your house? Do you create a college savings fund for your children? That's what we do in terms of helping people with financial empowerment. Our entrepreneurship work is different now. Over the last year and a half, as businesses have faced so much uncertainty, not knowing whether or not they would be a continuing interest or whether they would have to shut their doors temporarily or permanently. The Chicago Urban League, in partnership with the city, in partnership with the state, in partnership with the county, because we love everybody, <laughs> was able to give out over $7 million to small businesses so that they could continue. So that they could continue to serve this community. But it wasn't just the money, although we know that it's important to get the money. It was advice. It was mentorship. It was counseling. It was technical assistance. It was helping them to think about how do I pivot in the face of a pandemic? How do I pivot? Uh, in the face of, of civil unrest with social justice. And so our entrepreneurship work looks different. And then it occurred to us, even in the midst of a pandemic, that the Next One program, established back in 2002 under the leadership of Cheryl Jackson, might be important as we focused on the elimination of the wealth gap, as we focused on pushing back against structural racism. And so we brought that back and now have 10 businesses that we're able to focus on as they look to improve their access to capital, as they look to improve their model and as they look to take their businesses to the next level. And just to, um, and just to talk about how important Next One is, I'll give you two alumni, Jimmy Akintugende and Amy Hillier. So we know that that program has the ab ability to help businesses grow. When we think about our work in the area of workforce development, our flagship in that area is the solar training program. In fact, I spent some time this morning with our solar training uh, 
residents and our solar training participants and the staff of that program. And I have to give a thank you to ComEd for allowing us to establish that program. And, <laughs> and it's a cohort-based program where we are able to train people on solar panel installation. And so not only do you have an opportunity at a job, but you have the opportunity at a life-changing career. And because we know that we're becoming a greener, more sustainable society, we know that these are long-term career opportunity. And when I was talking to the participants in the program today, they said, thank you for giving us an opportunity to make a difference, not only in the lives of our families, but in the lives of our community. And so workforce looks a little different for the league now than it did in 1916, but it is still important to the participants and their families and to the community at large. Our program is different because now we have leadership development. How many impact alum are in the house? I knew there are some there. As well as current participants in this current class. The impact leadership development program is one of the premier leadership development programs in the city. It is focused on black professionals, not just so that they can climb the corporate ladder or the ladders at their nonprofits, at their jobs. We want them to do that. But we are creating the next generation of civic leaders to serve on the boards at the city club and at other clubs and at other boards in the community, and yes, in corporate boardrooms throughout this city. And then we provide programming in youth services. When we contemplated and anticipated the shutdown shortly before the pandemic, um, our executive team sat around our conference room table. And the first thing we talked about wasn't health. I mean, we all knew that the pandemic would have an impact on the health of our community, but we talked about education. We knew that because there is a continuity that is required for education that any small disruption in education would be a problem. And we saw from what we heard from Dr. Jackson, Mayor Lightfoot, and so many others that it was in fact a problem, but we were a part of the solution as we worked with Chicago Connected to get people connected to the internet, but also to get them devices that they could connect with so that that disruption would be either short-term and short-lived. So our youth services program was a part of that Chicago Connected network. But it wasn't just the ability to continue in school, but it was also the ability to continue being connected with their friends, to understand this pandemic, to understand and provide voice to the civil unrest that was occurring. 
And so our youth services department created an entire series, thanks to the support of Starbucks and other corporate partners, so that we would be able to provide a forum for our youth to have those important conversations. And one would have thought, well, gee whiz, they're on Zoom all day for school. Are they really going to continue to engage on Zoom in the evening? And they did. They did. They talked about uh, the impact of COVID on mental health. They talked about whether or not they even believed that there was a pandemic. And as um, Dr. Gale can imagine, those conversations were a little unnerving for us as adults who knew that the pandemic was real. But we knew we needed to give them an opportunity to talk it through. And they had a real conversation with members of police departments throughout this area so that they could exchange their ideas and let them understand what they thought about police community relations and how they felt. And that created the beginning of not just a dialogue, but a solution-oriented project that allowed our youth, our Chicago youth, to win the National Urban League case competition by developing, <laughs> by developing a solution to police community relations. So we're excited about the ability not only to win that competition, but to share that with the Chicago Police Department so that they can have that insight as they work to rebuild and uh, really restore police community relations in this community. With our entrepreneurship department, uh, not only did we provide the opportunity for Next One, but we also worked with other organizations to add mentoring, to add coaching for businesses, for any business that sought the services and support of our entrepreneurship center. And the result of that was another National Urban League winner as Gallery Wishard uh, just two weeks ago won the pitch competition through the National Urban League and a $75,000 prize. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, Chicago is representing well at the national level. But one of the first things that came out of the national, uh, out of the Chicago Urban League during COVID had to do with our research and policy center, because that is uh, one of our key areas. And it was a paper, a white paper that talked about COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19 in the black and brown community. And it was appropriately titled, An Epidemic of Inequities, Structural Racism and COVID-19 in the black community. It was published in May of last year and it has been widely cited nationally because it dis just didn't talk about the health risk and the inequities in health, but it talked about all of the factors, where we live, how we live, 
where we work, how we work, all of the factors that made black and brown people more susceptible to contracting COVID-19 and death from it. And as a result of that research by our research and policy team, we were able to create a COVID-19 help center and to focus our work on those issues that we knew were important in the community and that were necessary. We were able to establish very early on a vaccine working group long before the vaccine became available. And we said to those who were in the public health arena, who were preparing for the administration of the vaccine, we need to demystify this because while you may think that people are gonna run and get this vaccine, because it is being put on the market at record speed, and we know that's a good thing, but we've seen government do good, fast things that have not always been good for black people. So there was a concern about it. We knew that accessibility was going to be important. And we knew that transparency about how it was developed and how it was being administered was going to be important. Now, it didn't mean that you weren't going to get some myths. You know, the one about the transistor being administered with the vaccine and the chip. And, and, and it always confused me because why should you worry about a chip in a vaccine when you're carrying around a cell phone <laughs> that can tell anybody anything that they ever want to know about you? And you worried about the vaccine? <laughs> or you know that myth about, I don't know what's in the vaccine. And I'm like, what's your adult beverage of choice? <laughs> You drink Tito's, <laughs> scotch, what's your beverage? Wine, when's the last time you read the label of that bottle? Talking about you don't know what's in the vaccine. I mean, at some point, it's gotta make sense, but the Chicago Urban League can send that message and we can do it in a way that helps people to understand. One day, um, we were having a vaccination drive in our parking lot, and the traffic was a little slow. And so Andrew, uh, who's here today, and Penny, who's not, and I decided we were going on a mission, and we were gonna find some candidates. And so we started on one end of 47th Street near the league and walked the length of it, or as far as we could. And as we came back, we looked like the Pied Piper. <laughs> In fact, Margaret was trying to figure out where we brought all the people from because she was out there with the housing team as well. And as I was talking to people, uh, just engaging, one-on-one -on -one with them, and um, really talking to them about why they hadn't been vaccinated or whether they would consider being vaccinated. Those conversations converted folks who were really unsure. It wasn't that they were anti-vaxxers or that they had made a clear decision not to be vaccinated, but they just weren't sure and no one had taken the time to talk. And that's what the Urban League does and we're able to do it because we're in the community. And so we started settling folks. Now we're still doing it, but we're doing it in a different way. And so as we think about 
our role, we think about it in three ways. We're a convener, bringing the community together around issues that are of importance to the community. In fact, that's what we're doing now, along with some others, with the One Central development and making it relevant and important to the black community. We did that around the census, helping people to understand the peril of an undercount in our city. And so we have a role as a convener and have served in that capacity since our inception. We do the programming that I've kind of laid out to you. And then we do some of the most important research that we have seen. Uh, the cost of segregation, the cost of a disparity in treatment of the opioid epidemic, the cost of the census undercount, as I talked to you about earlier, and of course, the work that we did uh, in terms of the research for the impact of COVID-19. Right now, we have a, a paper and research underway about not just the financial impact of COVID on businesses, but the impact, the psychological impact of the business owner. Because people always talk about money. That's something that's easy to talk about. They rarely talk about the psychological impact of the pandemic. And then, as you've seen in many years past, we have reported on and uh, published the impact or the state of Black Chicago. We did it the last time in 2019, and I'll give you a preview. We're going to do it again in 2022. One of the other things that we've done over the last 18 months, thanks to um, our partners from PwC and Strategy Ann, was to really update and rethink our strategic plan. You know, if something's been around for over 100 years, sometimes it can get a little stale or it needs to be retooled, and that's what we did. And in that process, we came to a conclusion. And it was a very simple conclusion. And it was simply that if we were not engaged in work that did two things, then we shouldn't be involved in it at all. What are those two things? If we were not working to dismantle structural racism or working to reduce or eliminate the racial wealth gap, then we were in the wrong business. And so every time somebody brings us an idea, every time somebody uh, says they want a partner, and those are many, we ask ourselves, will this help dismantle structural racism or will it get us closer to eliminating the racial wealth gap? On Monday, we're going to be a part of an announcement with Chicago State and the city colleges and BMO, Harris Bank, and Monroe Capital. And I'm not going to preempt that announcement, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you to stay tuned uh, in a program, a new program that's partnering with a program that's already been announced, where we will reduce the racial wealth gap and work towards dismantling structural racism. Uh, the work that we do 
in all of our programming is done with that in mind. And the most important thing that we learned during our strategic planning process is the value of partners. Old established partners like the Chicago Community Trust and ComEd and so many of the banks, Fifth Third and others, but also new partners like Emerald South and Boeing and so many other new partners that we have developed like One Central. And what it allows you to do is not necessarily, uh, because some people are a little hesitant about partnerships. They're wondering, who's going to get the credit? That's the question that always comes up. And what I say to them and our team is, I don't care who gets the credit as long as the work gets done and people are helped. And what you learn, and, and I'm sure many of you have learned this from partnerships, is that through those partnerships, you are able to go further, faster, and do more with less. And that when funders, and those of you who are funders in the room can attest to this, see a group of people come to them together, then they are more confident in the ability to provide funding because they know that they will be able to see a program go to scale. That's my favorite word, taking something to scale. Uh, last year, we um, helped 15,000 people. And um, you know, when Calmetta brought me that number, she thought it was a pretty good number. Y'all probably thought the same thing. And I said, how many people live in the city of Chicago? 15,000, it's okay. But we have got to take our programming to scale so that we can impact that much more people. I mean, after all, we know how to take parties to scale, as many of you have seen um, through your attendance at the GFD. And so, uh, and we will be back November 6th in person with our vaccinated friends. Uh, but our role, and I would submit to you the role of every organization, is to impact as many people as you can. So um, here's what I'll leave you with. I told you I wanted to make the case for why our work should be your work. Last year, we saw the scars of over 401 years laid bare for anyone who would pay attention or who cared to see it. And um, it was really a surprise and shock to some people. But to others of us, it was the logical conclusion of what happens when you try to put a Band-Aid over a surgical incision or when you try to paint a room that it has had dark paint and you want to paint it white or a lighter color without using primer, or when you clean up for company by putting everything in the closet <laughs> and sweeping all the dirt under the rug. We now know what we should have known a long time ago piecemeal remedies don't work. We have to take the time to correct 
the wrongs created by all of the things that have been taken from black, brown, and disenfranchised people over the last four centuries. Everything from their very beings to our labor, to our possessions, to our dignity. And I would suggest that the only way to correct the centuries of wrongs is for each of us, no matter what color, national origin, religion, where we come from, where we live, who we love, for each of us to determine what role we should play in setting the score right for black people, brown people, disadvantaged people, people who have been taken advantage of. Now, you don't have to work at the Urban League. You don't even have to serve on the board. I would suggest to you that in each of your arenas, there is something, a small thing, that you may be able to do to help us get this right. Because here's the thing, if we don't work together collectively to move this forward, we're gonna keep getting the same bad results. Because here's what we know and what we've seen. The folks who don't want the wrongs to be corrected, they are in lockstep with each other. And they are developing schemes and plans, and they are plotting every day. So those of us who know better, who want better, who want to do better, we have to work together so that we can see better results for our children and for their children and for their children. We owe them that. And so that's my challenge to you. Let's do the work and let's do it together. I'm going to uh, give you guys a couple of minutes because I neglected to remind everyone to put their business card in the bowl. Jan, is it, where is it? It's somewhere um, while we're getting questions together. So um, last form, I believe my good friend Jessica got lunch and I said, oh, when are we going to lunch? So I know I've got one lunch coming. I'm totally joking, Jessica. Um, but please make sure that you, yeah, I think Jan's collecting them now. And if you're writing questions, please get to writing. Karen did say that she, um, Mayor, as many of you call her, by the way, was um, looking for lots of questions. So please bring your questions if you have them. Um, so if you all were wondering why I jumped up a few minutes ago when all the noise started happening, uh, this is cultural, so some of you may get it and some of you won't. I'm a choir director and not an usher. <laughs> And, but a whole bunch of my people are ushers. My mother was an usher for 40 some years. So I jumped up and I'm like, what are they doing making all this noise? Well, you all saw they were taking your lunches out, right? So I'm sorry to the staff, but I was like, oh, that noise is not necessary. And if you grew up in a church like me, you did not get to make that kind of noise. So I'm um, giving Mayor a couple of minutes to get some water. And she's like, I'm a pro at this. What do you mean? 
Uh, thank you very much. The words were excellent. Um, and I love to walk away from a presentation or a speech learning things and to know about um, the $7 million in small business assistance, those types of things. Um, Dr. Helen Gale was sitting next to me. And of course, she already knew all of this because she's like smart and wonderful. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. She's like, mm-hmm. Like, be quiet and listen. So um, I think that there are so many things that we could talk about, and I'm hoping that we get into some of those in the questions. So uh, I will start, if you're ready, from Alex Sims, who is head of Black Bench Chicago and doing a number of wonderful things when you talk about young people um, stepping forward and moving forward. Um, Alex, are you impact the used-to-be person, fellow? Yeah, okay. The first class? No, Oh, Okay. So, um, and she's a city club member, so Dr. Mazur, we don't have to harass her too much. Uh, Alex says, what role do you see millennials playing in pushing black progress into our ecosystem? So, um, I, thank you, Alex, for that question, because it's so important. I'm a, a parent of a millennial, and so I'm counting on millennials, um, I think we all are as we look towards social security and and other things. But you know, I think that, <laughs> and what I understand is that with every generation comes a different approach to problem solving, and the beauty and what's important about um, the energy and the intellect and the efforts of millennials is that they bring a new approach. Uh, my daughter Jordan and I argue all the time about how to solve problems, but the fact that we have millennials engaged in the problem solving process. I think one of the challenges that we have in the black community is that we don't always move over mm. as older uh, leaders, older folks in the community. And it doesn't have to mean that, it doesn't mean that you have to disappear, but you have to give space, whether you're talking about in sororities, or whether you're talking about in businesses, or whether you're talking about in community-based organizations, you have to provide for generational leadership so that it can, um, so that the ideas will remain fresh and new. And here's the thing, I learn so much for millennials, from millennials. And that's one of the major focus areas and one of the major reasons why IMPACT was started was to give that opportunity for millennials to lead. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important. So that's a word to some of us to move over. <clears throat> Jeff Carroll, who is not a City Club member, I'm, I'm not going to, where is Jeff? Okay, if Dr. Mazur comes after you, just, you know, you know, oh, I'll fix that up, hook that up. Um, Jeff is with Honeywell International, and he says, Illinois Senate Bill 2408 was signed by Governor Pritzker on September 13th. It connects energy opportunities with minorities. How do you envision the league leveraging this new and Thank you. Innovative legislation. You saw me struggling with that, didn't you? <laughs> well, I think that um, we've already sort of started down that road through, road through our solar training, but it allows us to open that door even wider. And, and thank you, Jeff, for that question, because not only can we now provide solar training, um, I know that Andrew has an entire line of, of ideas, whether it is the creation of charging stations and the ability to build those. Uh, we have a new urban tech program that would provide the workforce, but more importantly, through that bill, we'll now be able to support uh, urban 
businesses or uh, businesses in the green urbanism space, which is what I call it, or the green and uh, more uh, environmentally sound, sustainable space. That gives us an opportunity to go to our partners, uh, People's Gas, ComEd, NICOR, to say, uh, to Honeywell, to say, how can we create business diversity opportunities in the sustainable space? And what can we partner on, just like we partnered on and are partnering in the workforce training space? So that's a new opportunity for us. And we can use the support that comes out of that uh, House bill or the Senate bill to do that. Mitch Dickey, are you here? Uh, that was a fly, I was trying to fly away. I wasn't just waving at you. Um, Mitch is from the Illinois University of Illinois Systems and he says, how can public higher ed play a stronger partnership role with the league to dismantle systemic racism and to close the wealth gap? What strategic goals should we have? And you mean Illinois, U of I specifically? Wonderful. Well, um, thank you for that, uh, Mitch, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to sit with you all and, and talk about uh, ways that we might partner with the U of I system, particularly around STEM, and we've done so much STEM work with our youth services as well. And I think the real opportunity with higher ed is that we provide a pipeline uh, for our universities, uh, whether it's uh, partnerships that we have with Chicago State and City Colleges and U of I and U of C, all of the local schools, but also our HBCUs. Uh, and certainly um, Chicago State is a predominantly black university, but HBCUs all over the country uh, where we create that pipeline of young people who will go to those schools and hopefully not just stay and go other places, but come back and bring that talent to Chicago. But it's also to provide um, support in the community to businesses. As an example, a lot of the work that we've done through our Next One program has been built through our partnership with Kellogg, with the University of Chicago, we're working currently with the Loyola Institute for Racial Justice to build that out. And so um, there is an opportunity for the Urban League to really look at the research that we do, the programming that we provide, and to inform that, in, that programming and research with partnership with public uh, or higher ed. And, um, and ultimately that's important as we again, take those programs into the community. We've got just two more questions. Um, this is from an unknown. Uh, how will you communicate to members of di disinvested communities and neighborhoods that one central project matters and to them, how will you match that up with the Urban League strategic goals? It's a tough question. I'm not, I'll let you handle that. That's a great question. Um, because let me tell you, um, a year ago, when Bob Dunn and the One Central team came to me and said, hey, we want the Urban League to be involved in a new uh, downtown, or they called it the South Side because technically uh, it's South of the divide. Uh, and I said, um, that's not the South side. Mm -hmm. And then they went on to talk about South side works. And uh, for the first two or three calls, I said, well, tell me your sequence. You know, are you going to do the development? And then, you know, a year or two years later, you want to talk about the South side? And they were like, no, no, that's not how we're gonna do it. I said, well, let's work together 
to build something that at the same time we're building this amazing development in the stadium and McCormick Place and museum area and we're creating all of this connectivity that we are simultaneously providing the opportunities on the South Side. And that's what we have been able to build in partnership with Landmark and the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and uh, the Black Leadership Council and, and so many others. Because we understand that the best way for development to impact a community is not to just say that we'll provide a job here or there or we'll provide a business opportunity here or there because quite frankly, under those circumstances, only a handful of people eat, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really to create a structure where everybody wins. We know the developers gonna win. They've designed a project to win. You know, we see evidence all over the South Loop and West Loop and North Loop, all over the Loop, where folks have been winning in the central part of the city for decades, centuries. What we need to see is a plan where folks on the South Side are winning at the same time. Yes. And so that's how we were able to sit with them and develop that. And, and we saw the league's role as stewardship to ensure that, to say every time they brought us an idea, to say every time they brought us a concept, how do folks on the South Side win? How do folks in the community win? And so the result of that has been a program that not only creates jobs, because jobs are important, and access to those jobs much quicker than they occur today, but it creates business opportunities with 100% bonding and 100% insurance and capital, access to capital through the program. But it also creates development all the way up and down the South Corridor so that the only place one central will impact is not just the museum or stadium or the McCormick Place area. It'll be all the way up and down the corridor of the metro, of the transit. And ultimately, the community will see sustained investment and the reason for that is that we will be able to leverage through this program $20 million a year over the course of 20 years that will spur that investment in the community. And when I say leverage it, it doesn't mean it ends there. It means that we will be able to use that money for the additional investment that will occur. The millennials would say, that's what's up. I mean, that's, it was a tough question, but you take somebody from Gary who went to Harvard to be able to answer that question. I would never want to argue in court with you, ma'am. So this is the last question. And hi, Francie. This is a wonderful question from Francie Harrington. Um, this will be our last. One, how is the Urban League helping to learn history from our elders, like Mr. McKeever? And two, how is the Urban League working with youth on programs like Lyric Unlimited? How do we elevate and engage their creativity? Thank you, Francie. And you talk about, uh, I talked about partnership, new partners. Open Door Advisors has been just an incredible partner to us, and, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so last... June, and our kids are really, really uh, incredible. They did a, um, a video where they had the opportunity to hear from Mr. McKeever, Mr. Compton, 
And, you know, I have been honored to just walk in the footsteps of just some amazing league directors, Mr. Compton, Andy Zob, Cheryl Jackson, Barbara Lumpkin. I mean, you know, and, but they were able to not only video them, but they were able to sit and hear from them, get the wisdom from them, get advice from them, uh, hear about Chicago at a different time, particularly the black business community in Chicago. That type of experience for our youth was priceless. Lyric Unlimited, and this was something that, um, you know, was the brainchild of Eric and some other folks at the Lyric Opera. And, um, you know, as a result of that, I, I'm honored to serve on the Lyric Board, even though I know uh, this much about the opera now. I have an appreciation for all types of music. Once upon a time, I played a French horn. Uh, long, long time ago. But it allowed our young people to have exposure to the back of the house, because see, that's opera talk, it's theater talk too, and the front of the house, to understand about performing in an opera, but all of the things that go on from the business of the opera to the lighting and sets and all of the things that are involved. And it's not just to get it from lectures, but to have a hands-on experience because they actually produce, they write, produce, act in, direct their own opera through their experience with Lyric Unlimited. And, um, if you want to see just an incredible program, go on YouTube and pull up the Chicago Urban League and Limit Lyric Unlimited, this last opera. And you know, sometimes when you go to the opera, you're not really sure what's going on. I mean, some of us aren't. I mean, <laughs> I'll speak for myself. But if you sit down and watch this operetta, is what they call it. You'll understand every aspect of it, but it will hit home for you in just an amazingly different way. So it's a wonderful uh, partnership. Again, talking about partners and, and Lyric Opera is one of our important partners.